All right, so last time we were looking at data from the consumer complaints database and uh, I gave a big warning that this data is actually very large. Um, it's about 215 million records. <clears throat> um, and I actually ended up, I, I last time I did reduce the number of records, I just sliced it. Um, and I thought it would it would be sufficient, but I ended up slicing it again. <laughs> so I actually, um, uh, where is it? Consumer complaint narratives. Yeah, I just put it. Oh, I think I, I don't think I um, included that cone chunk. Um, I'll make sure to turn it back on. But it ended up, I cut it down to 200,000 records. Um, I think what I had before was something like, uh, actually, no, 150,000 records. I had 200 records and I cut out 50,000 and then dropped the NAs. Um, okay, to cut it down even more. <laughs> so, um, Let's see. So we have testing and training. We were looking at pre-processing. We the first um, the first classification model that we used was um, a Bayes classifier, a naive Bayes classifier um, that fitted model was like uh, twelve gigabytes. When I tried to do it for the first um, the first original data set. Uh, let's see. So we looked at the results of that, the performance of that uh, model. Um, and it's not bad. It's pretty good. So it, uh, the curves for each of the folds, so 10, we did tenfold cross validation. And for each of the folds, we plotted the ROC curve. And there's pretty, you know, good distance from the, um, from the line and then building the confusion matrix um it's okay the prediction the classification for credit related complaints versus non-credit complaint uh, non-credit related complaints could be a little bit better so this um lower right quadrant for other is is stronger then we compared to a null model, which we discussed was just what would happen if you know the model were just to take the most frequent, like predict the most frequent um, class. And then we did um, we started talking about lasso classification, um, right? Uh, like what is a regularized linear model? What is lasso? Um, so we talked about how the penalties are set. So this uses logistic regression from GLM net um, and we built the workflow, um, but this penalty for the um, coefficients it is kind of arbitrary. So we go ahead and fit it and we get the performance and visualize it. So we can see that the, um, Accuracy is about 0.87 and ROC is about 0.93, which is very similar to what we got for the naive Bayes classifier. Um, so it's a little promising. And it definitely performs better, though, in terms of uh, classifying the, um, the type of complaint based on the confusion matrix. Um, but then we get into tuning. So like I mentioned before, that pen, that penalty argument was a, a constraint was a little arbitrary. So we can actually tune to get uh, the best regularized penalty, regularization parameter penalty. Um, so what we end up doing is we actually train many models on resample data and then see what, see how it performs. So I think this is where we um, 
kind of left off last week. So we have our specific, the same specification, but we use, there's like a particular tune function um, for the penalty. So I think that just set that basically um, uh, for our specification that, that basically states that the, the penalty is going to be uh, set by a function. Um, and so it'll be tuned. Um, so yeah, we pass that tune function to, into penalty. And then what we do is that we um, create a grid of 30 levels, like 30 different options. And I think this is where um, maybe Juwan or Justin input on how these might have been selected. Um, and then let's see. Uh, okay, so we tuned um, our our model. So we pass in the workflow, we add the recipe, we add the model, um, and then we pass in the uh, lambda grid for each of the uh, penalties. And then we can see using tenfold cross validation. Excuse me, for each of the folds, what the best penalty value would be. So we use a collect metrics function um, from Tidy Models on the uh, tune resample object RS, and we get each of the measures for um, each level. So it ends up being for each possible, uh, for each of the penalties, it uh, produces an accuracy and an ROC AUC value. Um, so we end up um, visualizing the, perf the performance based on each of the regularization penalties. So we take that uh, resampled objects and you can see the accuracy and then it just drops. Um, as the the amount of regularization, the, the penalty gets larger. Um, I think that kind of makes sense, right? Because the point is to um, try and constrain the coefficients of the model, I think as, as close to zero. So you could potentially avoid the risk of any uh, risk of overfitting, right? And so if the, penal, pen, the penalty is, I guess this penalty gets larger, it's not really constrained. Does that make sense? Am I interpreting this correctly? Say that again, sorry. I was just thinking out loud on um, the, like how we interpret this plot. So it plots out each of the performance metrics for each uh, penalty value. And you can see that they, the accuracy and ROC AC values drop as the, um, the penalties get larger, right? So this is the, the penalties on the X axis. Um, and I was trying to interpret what that meant. And I think that, uh, I think it kind of makes sense because the smaller the penalty, penalty, the less kind of uh, wiggle room for the coefficients maybe. Like the, the reason why you want to constrain the coefficients is to kind of avoid the risk of overfitting. And so you, kind of apply a stricter penalty, like a very small penalty maybe, and then a larger one as it gets larger, uh, your accuracy kind of drops. And I, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud, trying to make sense of it in my head. I don't know if you guys have a different interpretation. Yeah, I think I, it gets larger, the regularization parameters, as you can see the accuracy uh, is dropping, I think. 
yeah so the less the granularization number it, um the the better the accuracy as we can see here uh, yeah i think oh no is that correct yeah so these are small so as the regularization gets larger but i'm trying to understand yeah, that's what I, why, yes. why that happens like intuitively I think Justin did a really good job explaining in the chat. If you haven't oh. read it. Um, so Justin says, uh, the smaller the penalty, the less regularization, the drop off at the larger penalties means the model becomes too inflexible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. OK, this is Bob Dylan in the chat. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. All right. So, um, yeah, so I, I, that I think validates kind of the line of reasoning that I was going with. So basically it becomes uh, too, too constrained um, that it can't, it can't really do, predict anything. <laughs> um, all right, so, then uh, we see that when we look at the um, the best value, so we we're looking specifically at uh, we we picked here ROC AUC, and there's a show best function. You can see that there is the 0 0.00788 is the very first one, um, and it actually has the same um, mean ROC AUC value. Um, so that we're just going to use that, um, that penalty value. And so we, we pass it back into, um, we have the, our resampled model and then we s use a select by one standard error. We choose the model. We choose the model with the best ROC AUC within one standard error of the numerically best model. Choose the, we will choose the model with just ROC AUC within one standard error. Oh yeah, um, I really don't understand this part. Um, I was um, reading one paper they were saying about them um, uh, talking about the standard error between different um, uh, different score functions. So mm -hmm. yeah, I really I have a question here as well. What really means uh, the standard error uh, between different uh, score? What does that really means? Within one standard error of the numerically best model. That's what I'm trying to, the numerically best model. So the model, the numerically best model has an ROC AUC of 0.953. So we basically just want to make sure that the regularization penalty, uh, the, the ROC AUC of the associated metric for uh, performance metric of the penalty value is in with is within one standard error of 0.953. So I think he's showing here we could use the show best and we can see here that 0.7 0.0078 and it has a, this penalty has a mean value of 0.953 for the ROC AUC, but it's uh, has a stand, standard error of 0 0.00101. But this one has a smaller, this one under here actually has a smaller standard error. Um, so he, I think what he's trying to say is that we could use this 
or we can um, choose a simple model with higher regularization. So basically, this model chooses the best ROC based on one standard error, within one standard error of the numerically best model. And so, yes, so it actually ends up picking this second, this second one because of the standard error right here. So instead of just like selecting this penalty using show best and just saying, okay, I'm going to use this value because it has the highest ROC AUC, this function um, compares each of these values based on the um, standard error. So whichever whichever number is within the within one standard deviation. Um, so what the, do they really means this within one standard error? What this statement means within one standard error? Bob says it's not that the second one has a smaller standard error, it's that the AUC is statistically indistinguishable from the best one and its penalty is higher, i.e. a simpler model. So it, the AUC of the second one is statistically indistinguishable from the best model. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to talk. It's just really loud where I am. So oh, okay. Let me know if it doesn't work. But but yeah. So um, there's that mean column. Mm -hmm. And so that's the R. That's the AUC, the area under the curve for right. each model. And so basically what the select by one standard error function does is looks at the best model, looks at its mean and standard error, and anything that is like within a standard error is that's within that range created by that mean and standard error will be uh, like a model under consideration. And then within that set, of models that are within a standard deviation of the best mean, it'll select the simplest model. Simplest model. So the simplest model and meaning the, the higher penalty. Yeah, yeah. In, in Lasso world, uh, the simplest is highest penalty. OK, OK. Is that because of the variable selection that it does, if it's a higher penalty? Yeah, it's just that there's um, the like effective, it's called um, like effective degrees of. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So you're, you're going to choose the pen, the penalty that is higher within that range of values that are within one standard deviation of the best um, value and then uh, when you select the penalty, the higher penalty, it becomes more simple because it's not as um, uh, it's it's more it's it's more flexible. It's like not too inflexible, but not too um, loose. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that. Okay. If I understood this correctly, uh, the model becomes simpler as the penalty gets larger because uh, if you have more regularization into it, uh, it cuts out certain variables. So uh, higher the penalty, the less variables you get to work with. So the models become simpler by working with you know two predictors rather than like a hundred. Mm. I don't know. I think that's. What I'm understanding. Um, that seems to make sense because, like, okay, so if we continue, we can see that we're going to actually use that into our final workflow. So there is conveniently a finalized workflow function where you can pass in the workflow. Um, so this uh, tuned workflow that we've 
created here, <laughs> this, this thing. Um, so it just has the um, recipe and the model. And then we add to it the best um, penalty, the chosen AUC um, um, value. So the, and then when we find, when we run that, uh, we, we get our workflow that takes, that shows us our steps and our specification for the logistic model. And then we can see that our penalty is now that 0 0.0017 value. Um, and so now we're going to we're going to fit that again. We're going to fit that loss of regular regularized model to our training data. And then when we do that, uh, we can see that uh, the we can see feature by feature um, how the complaints um, not how these affect the complaint not being about credit. So like the classification. So what we do, it, what we're doing is we're um, we're taking that fitted model, and we are um, there's a function called pull workflow fit, um, and then takes that makes it um, a tidy data frame, and then we're going to sort by um, in ascending order, sorry, descending order, the estimate. Um, so, and remember here, the features are each token. So we see here a merchant transfer collect, you can see escrow debt. So this is probably like more mortgage uh, related complaints. And then when we reverse it, the estimates with the really low, so the, I mean, sorry, the features with the really low, um, Coefficients are going to be about credit. So experience, transunion, Equifax, reporting, freeze, yada, yada. Um, so it seems like that penalty value was, um, was sufficient in, in classifying these. All right. So um, we're going to move on to one of the case studies about sparse encoding. <clears throat> so, um, if you're not if you're not familiar, sometimes <clears throat> sorry, my throat is getting so sometimes um, you'll notice that with text data when you create a matrix. Um, when you transform a the data into a matrix, it can be um, kind of sparse, meaning that there aren't uh, for each features in the matrix, uh, rows and columns, there are not there may be a lot of zeros or null values in, in the middle for where they don't there aren't frequencies of those. Um, so that would be considered a sparse matrix. So. In this case study, we're going to talk about sparse encoding, um, and we're going to use the hard hat package to set a blueprint for pre-processing. Um, also, they're saying he's saying here that the regularized regression models that we did before can actually be more efficient when the text data is transformed into a sparse matrix rather than the data frame, the dense data frames that we had previously. So um, we create our blueprint by using the default recipe blueprint function. Um, this we select the composition D G C matrix, and this uh, what's this stand for again? So the so apparently the D, DGC matrix is the most common sparse matrix type from the matrix package. 
Um, I have a question. Okay. So um, when we did the chapter for embedding, we always tried to represent our matrix to be dense matrix, right? So why are they here saying like, um, so is it the model that works best for uh, sparse matrix? That is why we want to change our um, matrix to be sparse or what? You understand what I'm saying? No. Ah, okay. So what I'm saying is like um, here, they are saying we will change our data to be the sparse matrix, yeah. right? Rather mm -hmm. than the dense matrix, right? Um, why do we need to put our data into, a dense, into sparse format? Because we understand in the previous chapter um, where we uh, talk about embedding, you learn best when your data is dense format, right? But mm. yeah, they are saying we put our data in different structure, which is sparse. So my question is, why do we need to put it in sparse? Is it the model we are trying to fit? The lesser regression that requests the data to be in a sparse format or what? That's my question. Oh. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we are, if it's actually sparse or not. Um, because the book says it, what the book says is that by changing how the, the, the data is structured, we can take advantage of the sparsity, um, especially for models like lasso regularized models. Um, so that makes it sound like this particular model, um, is more efficient when it's when the matrix is sparse. So Justin's saying, I think it's just changing the data type. It's not sparse rather than dense. It's efficient and sparse versus inefficient and sparse. Is this for, are you saying this is particularly for um, lasso regularized model? Sorry, I'm asking Justin. So the ah. his response, he's saying it's what DGC matrix is doing. Oh, so it's basically making the sparse matrix efficient, so that like we don't have this uh, process where we truncate or may try and make it dense somehow yeah um there's an airplane currently passing over me so i hope you can hear it. but yeah that's what i think is is going on is that like a, a tibble for example is a really inefficient way to represent sparse data because it represents every cell of the tibble as a data point but if it, you have a sparse matrix uh there are ways to store that where you just say like where the data point is uh, where there's a non-zero entry and what that non-zero entry is. And so that saves a lot of memory and you can operate on it a lot faster. And I think that's what DGC matrix is doing is allowing you to run lasso models in this case, uh, a lot more efficiently. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, I think um, the, the engine, they talk about the previous one, um, G, GLM net. Um, they said in the text, it's more efficient with sparse matrix. So, I mean, you know, um, some models, they need different, they perform best in some uh, different structure representation. So this model, GLMNet um, engine, they works best when the data is so sparse. So that's, I think that's why they are trying now to change the representation to sparse uh, data. So um, if we have another engine, we may not necessarily change the data to sparse because the engine maybe need not uh, the data to be in a sparse form so that it can perform best. So yeah, I think that's maybe the idea, uh, something that I can add on top of that. Yeah, I what Justin said makes sense. I just need to, I guess, in practice, need to understand better 
when like the use cases so like when is it not appropriate yeah. like is it always yeah. you know you know what i mean like can you always yeah i know this? yeah like, can you so, always use a sparse matrix and mm -hmm. yeah um you know use so, this DC, dgc matrix uh form in your in your model or are there special use cases where it's not appropriate yeah so I, I can't remember on top of my head right now, but um, some models from the theory of machine learning, some particular um, uh, algorithms, they work best with sparse data, not like dense. So this is something that um, uh, uh, I can't remember on top which kind of models they work. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. Okay. I guess that's just something I'll have to figure out at a later time. So, uh, and for the sake of time, by the way, we only have like 20 minutes left and there's still some groundwork to cover. So I'm, I'm just going to continue um, because I have to finish this chapter today. Um, all right. So once we have our, uh, we've created our blueprint with the DGC matrix composition, we're now going to make our workflow that considers it. So now we have a sparse workflow object where we have, you know, initiate the workflow. And we define how we want the data to be passed into the model. So we have a recipe. We use our original complaint recipe, but instead we um, we 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 say that uh, we have a blueprint, and that's the sparse blueprint for this for the data. So don't pass it in as the data frame uh, or the tibble. Use this sparse blueprint. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, and then use the model um, to inspect. Okay, so now we can see in our workflow that we still have our logistic re regression. Um, we still have our penalty <clears throat> that is passed in with tune and GLM net um, model. I don't know what's going on with my throat? So. Um, we're going to do kind of the same thing. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip over this. Um, I'm going to kind of speed through it. Um, so essentially what he's doing here is we're going to, is that they are only going to try 20 levels of the, uh, of the pen penalization penalty values. Um, and this time it's going to use a range. So you can spe specify the range and the levels um, to get smaller lambda values, but eventually, you know, kind of like goes up to one. Um, and then we're going to fit it with the uh, BASO model to assess each of the regularization parameters. So this is very similar to what we had <clears throat> in the last section, uh, just with a different grid through the 10-fold ten, ten cross-validation. We're going to show the best um, our ROC AUC value uh, to check the performance. And we can see that the mean, the mean um, ROC AUC value is about 0.95. Um, so we can see it's nearly identical, but the processing was a lot faster for this, um, as Justin commented earlier, uh, when we use a sparse encoding blueprint. So we're actually going to this. We're going to keep with this um, for the rest of the chapter. Um, let me make sure. Let me make sure I covered everything for this one. Feels like something's missing. Okay, so it basically. The pre-processing, if you look at the book, there is like two main takeaways for, for this sparse encoding. So basically the pre-processing was not that much faster because we still have to do the tokenization and calculation of the TFIDF for each of the features, but the fitting of the model was a lot faster because for highly sparse data, the implementation of the regularized regression model was much faster than for um, than when it's given more dense input. So that's basically aligned what with what um, Justin was saying. 
which is true. When I ran this, it did run faster. Okay, the next section is now we're going to have our outcome uh, be multi class instead of two class. So this is, it was simpler before because then you get your like two by two table uh, for each of the classes. But now we want to deal with an outcome with more than with, with more than two classes and product actually has nine levels. So we're going to start from the top again, recreate testing and training because now we want to stratify by product part with during our split. And then we are, you can see just eyeball what the frequency of complaints uh, for each of the classes. So a lot of them, most of them are credit reporting, credit related, debt collection, mortgage, credit card or prepaid card. And then it just like starts to drop, right? Like some of these are just like, why is there a separate product for prepaid card when there is a category for credit card or prepaid card? So just kind of, you know, a little bit weird. Um, so there is class imbalance. And so we need to address this before we can continue. Otherwise, you know, you could uh, you, you could get some like poor prediction. So like they can't handle um, imbalanced data very well for minority classes. You could actually have some like major repercussions for that. Um, and also the fact that like not a lot of algorithms are built for multi-class classification. These are dots. Shan, did you draw three red dots? On my screen. Sorry. There's like three red dots just like floating on my screen. Is that me? Well, I think it's me. Maybe I I, I saw something puff off from my own end. Yeah, maybe me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was gonna say, what is on my screen? <laughs> so yeah, let me see. I think. Um, yeah. Or am I seeing red dots? <laughs> I need to go is to the me? room. <laughs> what about now? They're still there. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Well, at least it's not just me. All right. So one, one way we're going to handle this class imbalance is we're going to downsample the majority. Um, and so we pull in the, the feminist. I don't know if this is the right way to, to say this library. Um, but what we do to build our, our recipe is um, we are going to uh, use the um, token filter, which we have been, but also the down step down sample by product. So this makes it a more balanced um, outcome. And so this is mostly, this recipe is mostly the same except with the new step down sample step. Um, so we need to create, because of which we have to create a new cross-validation object. So we have our people CV, and then we need to recreate the, the lasso specification. Um, and this time, because we have a multi-class outcome, we need to use multinomial regression. So, and we're still gonna use the, the um, lasso. Um, and so we set classification, GLM net, um, and then we have to recreate the workflow. So, you know, it's, you know, the steps are, are cookie cutter again with minor modifications. And based on how efficient the last case study was, we're gonna also include um, the sparse matrix, uh, pass in the data as a sparse matrix, um, into our workflow. So you can see that there, you know, our model is multinomial regression. We have four steps, which now includes the downsampling due to the class imbalance. And we are penalizing using the tune function and using Joe and that engine. So once we um, have that, we need to create uh, our um, grid, our tune grid. Right, so we're gonna um, figure out what is the the tune the penalty values. So we pass in our workflow, the, each of the folds, all of um, the the grid that we created in the last section. So the smaller lambdas, 
And then um, the, the step to save the predictions. So when we run this on each of the, the folds, um, we can pull the best uh, the best fit model using show best uh, based on accuracy. And this gives us um, these values here, uh, the top five values. Uh, and you can see like the mean accuracy for this one uh, is 0 0.09. Um, so it is just okay, it looks like. We can visualize this confusion matrix for the first fold. So we um, filter the predictions um, for just the first fold. Um, we are going to uh, just use the um, penalty values uh, that are here, these, these ones. And then you um, get the confusion matrix, plot it, and then scale our um, scale our x and y um, axes, uh, so that you know we have our labels be. They're still it's still not like super great, but you can see here that. Um, this is really hard to visualize a little bit. Banking or services. What happened to the me or the diagonal? Shouldn't we be seeing like the diagonal like really strongly? Anyway, so I, I can't tell, to be honest, I think this is debt collection and I can't tell what this one is um, because this, these, this R, mark, mark, R markdown takes about an hour to knit. Um, I did not attempt to fix this plot. Um, but you can probably look at it in the book based on the data that he used and, and see something um, a bit similar. Um, okay, it doesn't look exactly the same. So now I'm a little bit concerned. <laughs> I, I'm expecting like the diagonals are all zero which is problematic. All right, I guess I do need to figure out what happened. Maybe the samples of the data you took may not actually be representative. So Oh, sorry. Um it's weak here. This sorry, I skipped to the bottom. So we actually end up removing the diagonal to get a better image of where the model doesn't do so well. But like even here along the diagonal, this classification is not very good. Like this, sh it like maybe for debt collection, it's the strongest. But like you can see here, like three zero zero twenty three. Like this is really this is a really weak classification. Um, and then we when we actually do remove the um, the classify. Uh, sorry, the diagonal. This isn't not so great. <laughs> um, so the next step is to try and create new features. So it's essentially collapse some of the features or um, create custom features that can help us distinguish between these classes. So like when I saw when we eyeballed the outcome, there was, you know, a little bit of weirdness um, with the uh, how the the outcome was labeled. Um, so the next case study is about um, including non-text data. So the next three case studies are creating these custom features. So non-text data is basically 
the you know dollar signs, not dollar signs, sorry, numbers. Um, there's a lot of like annotations and um, all this tag, zip code, state, like a, a bunch of stuff that that um, may be messing with our model a little bit. Um, so it, basically that section, and the reason why I'm not, I've skipped this section for, for time because what this section essentially does is just kind of, you know, refactors, um, dummy, dummifies, you know, gets categorical, turn things into categorical. So it's doing a lot of more cleansing and manipulation of uh, some of these, um, of the values uh, to try and improve the performance. And it goes through all the steps again. Section 7.8, is a section on data censoring. So, and that's something really important, but I have skipped this one. Um, because this is about credit, there is um, potential for protect, potent, oh my God, uh, potentially identifiable information. So there, if you look at the data, there is a lot of XXXX or XXX to like, basically censor credit card numbers or credit scores or credit whatever um social security numbers um and so we're getting a lot of xxx's in our data into our model so what we are doing is basically in this section trying to um in make some compare credit versus non-credit uh, by creating um, trigrams with the censoring to look at how like the top 25 most frequent trigrams that include censoring and look at the proportions um, and see where there are potential problems. He writes some functions for uh, um, using regular expression um, to replace the cases of XX and X, like all those X's, so strings with random integers. Um, so then we can see, you know, that it's, it's, it's easy to see that, you know, these are, um, censored if when we convert them to a number, like a numeric. Just take a second, it's like really easy to go through each of these two case studies. Um, all right, so really quickly, I did do the case study on creating custom features. So this one is related to se section 7.6. Um, sorry, 7.7, .7, this is a typo. Uh, because the model didn't perform so well in the multi-class outcome. So we're going to basically build a feature um, that uh, will have us um, detect credit cards, for example. So we, we, we're going to create custom features to help our model. Um, so like I said, um and and what part of the sorry my brain is already fried part of the um main advantages for creating custom features here is that uh is for feature engineering uh basically an application of domain knowledge so if you understand what you're looking for um you can create features um, that will help you better um, simplify your simplify your input um, into the model. Um, so that's what we're going to do here. So we are going to write a function to detect credit cards. Um, and that's we can start by saying, okay, well, we know this is how they're kind of represented, so we can use SDR detect. But then it's not really that great. So we're going to 
um, use some reg regular expression. So that requires a little bit of knowledge of how regular regular expressions work. Um, and then we can see that uh, when we test it, the um, it actually does um, detect the credit cards. Okay, so this is input. So like we have four strings here. This is not a credit card, but these are. So we get true, true, false, false. Yeah, this is an address, sorry. Um, all right, so then we just wrap that into a function. Um, and then we write a function to count that um, occurrence, count the occurrences. So we can see here that there are two, one, zero, zero for each of the uh, examples. And you'll see in a second how that actually comes back around. So this come this section answers the question: What evalu evaluation metrics are more appropriate? Um, so the answer here it depends. So there are some cases where you don't really care about false negatives or false positives. Like they maybe don't weigh as much. Um, but then there are some cases where it's really important um, to consider false negatives and false positives. Um, just for, you know, like, like in health settings, right? It's, you really don't want to have a false positive. Um, so we wanna make sure that your, um, your valuation metrics are, are solid. So um, what we're gonna do here is we are going to take that um, resample, the, going back to the naive Bayes, <laughs> naive Bayes uh, classifier that we did. Um, and we are going to make sure we include recall and precision in our metric set. So there is an art, there's an argument in fit resamples where you can specify the matrix, uh, sorry, the metrics. Uh, it defaults to uh, ROC AUC. And this is what I was talking about earlier at the very beginning. Um, in the book, this line isn't included. Um, but as you can see from all the other examples, fit resamples uses this line. And if you're just following the book, this will run, but the confusing matrix can't build because it's not storing the predictions. Um, all right, so we get our recall value and we can see that our recall is at 0.594 and we can get the recall value for um, each of the predictions. So for each of the folds, uh, um, yeah, so get, give me the recall value for each of the folds. And now we can look at the uh, confusion matrix uh, and get the, the true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. So we have our true positives, true negatives, and so and our false. And very similar to the um, outcome, the output of the naive base, the evaluation of the naive base, this doesn't perform so hot. So I think this is where the almost exact same values. Um, so when we put it all together, this is the full game. Um, we're going to start with feature selection. So we are going to create a new recipe using only the text. So this is complaint recipe version two. And we are going to use our complaints train. So this is going to be just the, the binary outcome. Um, and then we are going to add the custom functions to create the features that will help us better credit, credit and non-credit. So um, we have the credit count, credit card count, um, because we didn't, I didn't actually make the other two functions that were in those two case studies that I skipped. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and then once we, um, so once we have our function, we can add to our recipe. So we are gonna include here a step mutate to 
um, create a copy of our um, narrative, which is our the actual text, um, and then use the function on that um, using the step text feature. So um, this is weird. I do have text features. Anyway, so then we add our tokenized token filter step TF IDF. Then once we have that, we're going to use our sparse blueprint from um, se section 7.6. And now that we have a, our full workflow, we're going to be using the logistic regress re regression um, with five pre-processing steps with our tune, uh, our penalty that needs to be tuned. And this is the same, uh, it's a little bit more um, involved penalty grid. So we are now, we changed the range a little bit and we are including tokens, the max tokens, I guess, for each of these penalties. Um, and then we, we tune, we put everything together to tune. And this time we're going to look at accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. And when we do that, we can see each for each of the um, number of tokens, how the model performs uh, across each of the regularization uh, penalties. So actually as the, so, yeah, this makes sense. So the accuracy and the sensitivity are going to drop uh, as the regularization gets larger and the sensitivity basically has kind of a little bit of the opposite effect. Um, let's see. Uh, and then we're just going to pick the final parameters. So we're going to use the, um, instead of selecting by uh, standard error, we're gonna use the function um, select uh, PCT loss. So this is the um, percent loss compared to the best model. So by default, I think it's like 2%. Um, and, and use that to pick our best metric, which is going a uh, penalty, which is 0 0.00785. So then we're gonna plug that back in to finalize our workflow with the new penalty value, which is right here, and then fit the model one last time and collect our, ma our matrix, um, sorry, our metrics. Um, and we can see that we have a 0.878 accuracy and 0.94 ROC AUC value. And so when you actually uh, put it all together to make the confusion matrix, you can see that the performance is actually not bad at all. And our ROC curve is just like pretty good. <sighs> All right, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Oh, this was a lot. Um, sorry, but I'm glad we do it. We did it over two days. And I think, I don't know if you guys have any questions or not. All right, I'm good. Okay, so that is classification. I feel like I, I should have just kind of jumped to the section 12 and then gone through why each step is the way it is because it's very redundant as you go through, but at, at least you can kind of get a feeling for the process now. And uh, at least I have a better idea. And thanks to Justin and Juwan and, and Sham for helping me understand the penalties and all that stuff, um, under, uh, how, uh, interpret the visualizations. <laughs>